Thank you, Casey, and the, for leading us so beautifully and thoughtful words and beautiful songs. What beautiful songs we had today. Uh, I'm so glad we sang those songs because they are really a lead into conference in the way that they speak about our need, our heart, our restoration, all in Jesus. The mercy of God. The mercy of God is so big and the ways to show mercy are so great we can scarcely do it justice today. Last week we looked at the mercy of God and we saw that it was greater than all of our sin. Isn't that good? No matter how much we fail or how fractured we have become, God's mercy can be greater than any of our failures. And most wonderfully of all, as we turn to God in repentance, God takes failed people and uses them to establish his mission and his kingdom on earth through the church. Every one of us are not deserving of being called into his mission, but failed people are God's agenda for his plan to restore all things. We are part of it. You are part of it. And today we come to consider, as we saw with Peter, that there is a response to be made to the mercy of God. God doesn't want to just pour mercy out on you for your good alone. He pours mercy on you for your good and for his glory and for the restoration of the world. And so God's response for us in sending Jesus is that we might, when we receive his mercy, also respond to others. And how can we do that? In what ways? Well, one of the prime ways is this. You will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. That's the greatest response to God's mercy we can show. As God shows mercy to us, he wants us to witness to the one who was the demonstration of great mercy, and that is Jesus. In a mean and broken world, our greatest response is to witness or to shine out Jesus Christ to others. Show mercy to others, just as your Father shows mercy to you, said Jesus. Now, today I want to consider then a little more on this subject of mercy, particularly the how and where of mercy. What are some of the principles of mercy and what are some of the places where mercy can be shown? So let us now come and invite God to speak through us as we hear from his word today. Father God, God of mercy, we thank you so much for your incredible mercy towards us. Thank you that you show us what it is to demonstrate mercy to others. And I pray now, God, as we come to this important subject of being agents of mercy, of being your stewards of mercy, I pray that we might be not just here in a service to meet a particular law or a practice or some sort of a feeling of self-righteousness, but we might be here because we want to learn what you are saying to us and we want to respond to you today. Help our hearts be open in a responsive spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go through our message today, I'm going to give a couple of opportunities for you to share from your heart on any areas of mercy that we speak about. So I just invite you to be open to what God might say. We had a beautiful time of sharing in the first service. Uh, you don't need to share eloquently. You don't need to share theologically. You can just share what you sense from what is being said and maybe where God is speaking to your heart. So have a think about as we go through maybe what God might speak to you about. Well, how do we go about showing mercy? What are some of the principles of mercy? Well, firstly, we need to look and listen for people's needs. Now, that's the very first thing. You have your notes there. If you want to write this down in the notes, that's the first point, to look and to listen for people's needs. In other words, mercy begins with awareness, Paying attention, noticing. If you care, you'll be aware. If you don't care, you won't be aware. You won't look and listen. 
And I encourage you to be on the lookout and to listen for people who may need your mercy. This is what Philippians says, look out for one another's interests, not just your own. You know, we live in a very self-centered life, a very individualistic life, and we can often want to look out for our own interests. But we are encouraged to not do that, but to look out for the interests of others. That's the first principle of mercy. That's the open space to allow you to move in, to show mercy, to look and to listen. And if we don't do that first one, we're unlikely to be able to move with mercy. You know, one of the number one destroyers of mercy being shown is busyness and self-centeredness. We're too busy to stop, look and listen. And often we're too interested in our own outcomes that we're not interested in actually extending to someone else to look and to listen at them. But mercy begins with that. It calls for active attention of love. Jesus, when he saw the rich young ruler, it says he looked at him and he loved him. Now, maybe if you would look at someone long enough, you might see them as Jesus sees and love them enough to show mercy towards them. That's the first principle of mercy. Would you look? Would you listen? And then there's another principle of mercy. Don't be offended by their sin. You know, showing grace can be messy. But we are called to show unconditional love and just like Jesus, he hung out with sinful people. And often we can feel so self-righteous and so protective of our need to be pure and right that we are often reluctant to move into the places where people are acting and behaving and believing in a sinful way. Now, how can we look out for people, which is our first principle, if we look down on people? How can we do that? If we are to look towards them and embrace them, we need to move into their space. Jude says, show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. There are still others to whom you need to show mercy, but be careful you aren't contaminated by their sin. Now, to show mercy then is to be wise, but it is to be intentionally wise. It doesn't mean you have to accept everything about their behaviour, but you do need to move into their behaviour to get alongside them, not do their behaviour, but move alongside them and go past the offence so you don't reject them. Jesus never said you don't have to love that sort of person or that sort of person. He said look past their failure and reach in to their fracture because you might just be able to do something about that. 1 Peter says this, more importantly, love each other deeply. Love has a way of not looking at another's sins. When was the last time you did that? Look past someone's fault? Didn't raise it, didn't bring it up? Let it go. Look past their fault and saw their need. Love has a way of doing that, said Peter. Mercy looks out for people's interests rather than looking at their sins. Ephesians says, be patient with one another, making allowance for each other's faults. Why? Because of your love. You see, it's important not to expect believers to act like unbelievers until they are. Too often we are reluctant to be involved in some things, to get alongside some people because of their conduct or their attitudes. However, they're not yet followers. What do we expect? There is a moment that we need to be alongside them and demonstrate love even though everything is not like we want it to be. Now, we see this often with Jesus. In fact, Jesus got involved in people in ways that if we were with Jesus today, we might even raise some questions about it and think he's actually acting wrongly. One night, Matthew invited Jesus to dinner with his fellow tax collectors and many other, notice, notorious sinners. When was the last time you were with some notorious sinners? Well, actually, look around, you're beside them. <laughs> we're all notorious sinners. But these were people with a reputation for being notorious sinners. And the Pharisees were indignant. Why does your teacher eat with such scum? They said. 
When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. He knew he had to be there because he was the healer and they were the people who had the need. So he moved into the space. Now he said to these Pharisees, go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to be merciful, not offer sacrifice, for I have come to invite sinners to me, not those who think they are righteous. You know, there are many people who think they are righteous. There are many people who think they are doing it all well. But Jesus said, be careful because that might be you having a self-righteous attitude. He intentionally moved into the presence of sinners and was prepared to accept them because they hadn't yet come to know him. And as you show mercy, you may get exposed to some unsavoury characters or some unsavoury conduct and you may even receive some criticism for where you are. But if you are wise, intentional, not being contaminated by what's happening, you stay in that place because that's relating to someone who is in need. How else will they hear unless you go there with them? And the third principle is to choose your words very carefully. Mercy puts a monitor on our mouth. We sometimes need to hold off and not say the thing that we think we need to say. Colossians says, when you talk, you should always be kind and pleasant. Notice that? Kind and pleasant. Not nasty and abrupt. Kind and pleasant. So you will be able to answer everyone, how? In the way you should. Now, that suggests to me some discernment of answers, some crafting of words, some awareness of the context. Don't just blurt it out. Think about what you're saying for the good and the growth of the person. If you want to be persuasive, don't be abrasive. It doesn't work. You need to think about what you're saying. Philippians puts it this way. Do not say harmful things, but what people need. Words that will help others become stronger. Do you notice you need to think about this? And then what you say will do good to those who listen. Put a monitor on your mouth and a filter so that what you say is for the good of the person. That's showing mercy. The key to all of this is asking God for wisdom so that you know what to say, when to say it and how to say it. James reminds us the wisdom that comes from heaven is pure, peace-loving, gentle at all times and willing to yield to others. Wisdom is full of mercy. The fourth thing that is a very valuable principle is this. Value saving people over keeping rules. In other words, grace is greater than law. The Pharisees were careful, Jesus said, about their tithing. And he commended them for this. In fact, it's the only thing he ever commended the Pharisees about. They gave 10% of their income. But he said, then you ignore the other important matters of the law. Justice, mercy and faith. Yes, you should tithe, but you shouldn't neglect the more important things. What are the more important things? Love, justice and mercy you see we can get so right that we become wrong we can be so legalistic that we show no grace god and the good news of the gospel is god so loved the broken world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life it's good news we need to repent of sin we need to turn from it but the good news is god's mercy is greater than all of our sin We're not steeped in a whole list of do's and don'ts. And so at times remember that Jesus broke the rules in order to save the people. So in responding to the call to show mercy, keep in mind these very important principles. Show mercy by looking and listening, by not being offended by people's sins, by choosing your words very, very carefully, and by valuing saving people over keeping rules. And so having those now in mind, let's have a look at the places where we might find the opportunity to express mercy. 
Firstly, here's a place, burdened people. Burdened people. The Bible says this, carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Burdened people. Look for burdened people. Listen to people who are in a crisis. And so I want to just pause for a moment and this is one of those moments I'm giving you an opportunity to maybe think about where have you either carried someone's burden or you yourself have been the recipient of someone who came in and lifted you up when you were down. Either you've seen someone who has carried another's burden or you yourself have felt your burden was carried. Just pause for a moment. Invite God's spirit to prompt you and help you think about something. And then James has a microphone and I'd love you to slip your hand up and we'll just share for a moment or two in regard to this. Anyone had a burden lifted by someone else who carried that burden? Okay. I think we're in an ideal place to share burdens, John. Mm. We feel we're amongst friends, we're amongst family. Um, And I think this happens every week at Friendship Mm Centre. We're probably a group of us, about 25. We know each other really quite well. Mm. And you feel it's a safe place where you can come and share. Whether you have yeah. something that you need to share with other people or other people come and share with you. Mm. And I would feel that in the position that I am there, it's a privilege that so many people come and share things with me on that morning. Mm. And I was talking to Brenda um, yesterday and she says the same thing. We perhaps don't always get a lot of aircraft done, but that's not our main aim. Mm. We do an awful lot of sharing and our burden is um, lightened as we hope other people's burden is lightened as they come and share with you. So mm. I think we're in an ideal place in our church family where mm. we can share our burdens. That's wonderful. That's why we've always resisted any call to change things like Friendship Centre to Craft Group because it's primarily Friendship Centre. A place that burdens are lifted. Someone carries a need and a burden. Yeah, probably for me where I've been able to share my burdens a lot of late and some of the struggles that I've been having is with the uh, guys in my home group. Mm -hmm. Just the fact that, you know, at the end of every time when we meet, if we haven't discussed things during the time we've been together, at the end we sort of say, okay, well, what's happening? And, you know, Mm. we just pray for each other and share what's on our hearts and mm. struggles and successes and everything. Oh, that's the, the marvellous value of a small group ministry, isn't it? To be able to share with one another and to have that confidence and that, that sense of someone understands and they're helping me through that. Thanks. Um, I think recently um, I often walk the dog in a local park and there's a lady there, um, an, an elderly lady, who her little dog is her life and... Um, Recently, yeah, she was just, as you walked kind of together, um, just kind of random strangers in a way, um, combined by the, you know, mutual dog interest. Yeah. Um, she was sharing how she was worried that she would have to put her dog down. And so yeah. even just then, later yeah. that week, checking in on her and seeing how she was going, and she didn't have to, but um, just, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the, I guess not being too busy to listen to other people's um, things in whatever circumstance. That's beautiful. Checking in, I love what you said, checking in on her to make sure she's okay. Um, Virginia, would you share again what you said? Or if you don't want to, I can say it, but... Okay. Um, I shared in the first service, um, a few weeks ago, we had to have our dog put down. And um, I'll say (laughs) Elizabeth was one who helped carry our burden, not mm. completely, but certainly mm. helped share it and mm. lighten the load a lot. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. You know, we had a real doggy theme in the first service. There was a, um, some lots of things where doggies were part of the thing. And, but look, God's interested in the smallest detail of our life. And a doggy and a love for a dog is not a small thing. That's like losing a loved one. And um, that's a deep issue for Virginia. And Elizabeth, for her to raise that and do that with her, that, that was very, very special. And what you did with helping the other lady with her dog, that's so special. That's showing mercy to people, being available to care. 
we're going to have another opportunity, so please think of things as we go along. So burdens. Another thing is to look for people with unmet needs and help them. Find a need and meet it. Find a hurt and heal it. Is there any area that you have seen someone in need and you've actually reached in and met that need? Sometimes it's a financial response. Sometimes it's a, a, a physical help. Sometimes it's something as practical as um, helping them on a bus. It might be something as practical as helping people who just don't have the right change at the moment and they can't get that last bit of groceries. Have you ever reached in and said, here, here's a dollar, uh, have that? Or it might be other things that are more deeply rooted. But we are told each one of us is to look after the good of those people around us and ask ourselves, how can I help? How can I help? Now, that's exactly what Jesus did. He didn't make it easy for himself by avoiding people's troubles. He waded right in and helped them. And so I'm asking you to reflect for a moment again. Any word of testimony about an area or someone you saw in need and you waded in to help. We want to celebrate it. This is not for your glory. or your, This is Jesus' glory. Was there a moment you saw a need and you responded? And on the other side of the coin, were you in need and someone responded to your need? Or did you see something that really impressed you? There was someone responding to a need. Anybody got a word of testimony about a need being responded to? Okay. Down the front here. Eva. Eva. Um, these few days we have um, a continual going to Liberia mm -hmm. and then I got a family being calling they say um, some people in Liberia a family left in um, doing the Ebola they don't have family they don't have anything so what I did I bought rice and spaghetti all those things, then I made a big, um, like a big thing and fill in everything. I just sent it by the guide who going with the container. And he said, this is for who? I said, just take it and give it to people who need, who in need, who don't have food. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Eva. That's a beautiful response. And, and the wonderful thing about that is that's motivated by a genuine love and care for someone in need because you don't know who received that and therefore you don't get glory back for that. That's for the person and whoever got that need will never say thank you to you. So this was a full offering of yourself to God in an act of mercy. Beautiful. Any other one want to share on that one? Yes? I haven't done anything yet, but probably most of you have seen the rich, filthy rich and homeless, and I've mm. just finished watching that. Yeah. I'm sort of really touched by that. I'm mm. one of the ones who usually walks past the people with their mm. caps out and whatever, and just don't know what to do, but at least if I can throw in a dollar now and again, it would be helpful. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Wendy. Um, that is a program I'd encourage you all to watch, Filthy, Rich and Homeless. It's about people who have adequate means beyond that. They're rich and they're placed in a situation where they have to encounter what people who are homeless encounter. And uh, they come to some new awareness about what it is to be needing help and how much help doesn't come. So that called filthy rich and homeless. Then we can look out for people who are grieving and comfort them. I wonder if you've had a grief lately now, we've heard about Virginia and the grieving a dog, and that can be a very real grief. Other people have had a loss of some position or a job. No doubt Malcolm Turnbull's having a degree of grief at the moment in a genuine way because, um, in a way, what happened to um, another leader happened to him, and he might be reflecting on that too. And so people go through grief in all sorts of ways, but maybe you're shown grief to someone. God says to us this through Paul in Corinthians, God comforts us in all our troubles so that, so that, so that, what? That we might be comforted? 
No. Someone call it out. So that what? Right. So the comfort that we get is for our benefit, yes, but it's so that we might be a comfort to others who are in trouble with the same comfort that we ourselves receive from God. And I would encourage this thought that the comfort that Virginia felt when the loss of her dog happened, she'll be more able to demonstrate that same comfort in that same situation to someone else because she herself received of it. And so this is something about the ministry of mercy. Even your most grievous moments, even your most desperate feelings are part of God's work to build you and comfort you in order that you might be his mercy maker to others. That you might be an agent of mercy. You see, we're not here just for ourselves. We're not gathered just for ourselves. We are called into God's kingdom for his purposes. And this is part of a restorative intention in a broken world. Every act of mercy, every expression of care, every Lynn moment where she reaches in and says to someone and checks in on them, an act of mercy And somehow God is doing a work through all of that that we can't even see. But you are to be an agent of mercy by the same comfort that he showed to you. I wonder, have you received comfort from someone when you've been going through grief? Is there a moment in your life recently or some time back where you went through great grief and someone reached in and showed you comfort? The comfort of God Or you reached in and showed someone else mercy and comfort at a special time. Would anybody like to share? This might be a little more difficult one because you've gone through grief. Yes. Still difficult to talk about. But um, before we had Levi, we we had a miscarriage. And uh, my home group was amazing. And... um, comforted us in that and shared with us and um, just recently one of my non-Christian friends had an ectopic pregnancy where she had to have her fallopian tube cut out and um, I was able to pray with her and grieve with her Mm. and it was just an amazing example of that verse yeah yeah Um, and yeah how I can continue to be there for her in what I understand is a really difficult time yeah thank you Jackie look um, that's a a deep example of this very principle. Um, And there are people in this congregation who have gone through very similar things, a miscarriage or a lack of capacity to have a child, and it's a deeply difficult experience. And other people who have understood can sometimes reach in, sometimes not too early, but not, not too late either, and actually be of deep comfort because they too have understood So be a minister of mercy where God has used you to receive comfort or you've gone through a difficult time. That's a precious moment. That's a moment for your ministry to take root and share in whatever way you can. And then look for people needing friends and show hospitality. I saw a show the other night. um, It was called Bizarre Bodies. It it was a bizarre show because the bodies were really bizarre. And there are some people who had things like a a distortion, a a growth that came down from the chin and was about here, and they had to carry this distortion along. There's another lady I remember who had totally black um, skin down here and totally white and speckled skin all here. And that lady was in a park by herself because all the way through her life she'd been bullied and made ridicule of because of her look. And she was a very intelligent lady, a beautiful lady. She had nothing that would be offensive to anyone other than the way she looked. And it made it awkward in social context for her. And she grew up in a damaged and broken way because no one (laughs) reached in and was a friend. There are people like this everywhere, people on the bus that we might normally turn away from, people we walk past every day. We just heard Wendy mention the uh, rich and, um, what's it called? Uh, 
yeah, yeah, rich, famous, and homeless. Those people are now learning that the people they walk past, people are walking past them, and they can't even get a dollar sometimes to, to pay for something. You know, all around us, we're not in a pristine world. We're in a broken world. There are people who aren't doing it well. There are people feeling shunned and shamed and unable to socially relate. And we can reach in to people and demonstrate some hospitality. Again, what will cause us to show hospitality? Well, slow down enough. Again, Lynn said that. Slow down enough to look and to listen Slow down enough to reach past the offence. Slow down enough not to be so interested in what their fault might be, but what maybe you can help with. Look past those things and see a need and meet it. The Bible says this in Romans, look for opportunities to be hospitable. It's a lost art because we're too busy and individualistic, but people are hurting and they need our help. I was alone and you welcomed me and showed me hospitality said Jesus. I want to ask, because we're running out of time, I want to ask, um, when was Jesus alone and when was he welcomed and when was he shown hospitality? Does anybody know when this is speaking about? Anyone want to have a crack? Before he died on the cross. Okay. He, He was alone and he did need friends and did need to be showed hospitality. Anyone else want to offer something here? Yes. This is speaking about a situation where when in the filthy, rich and hopeless and lost and homeless, someone reached into that poor person who had a great big growth on their their face, that lady who had black down the side and white in the middle and speckles and was shown. When someone reached into her, she was alone, they were reaching into Jesus. They welcomed her, they welcomed Jesus. They showed hospitality to him, they showed hospitality to Jesus. That's what Jesus says. And somehow in the end day when we have the rewards in heaven which is never going to be a a lament moment, it's going to be a celebration. Somehow what's dished out there to people will be because Jesus said, you came to me when I was alone and you welcomed me when I was in prison and you showed me hospitality when I was essentially without any friends. And we'll say, when, Lord, did we do that? He said, oh, you did it in that situation and that situation and that one. This is the ministry of mercy. It's why we have the call for people to be part of restorative ministry because every step we take is to be caught up in the mission of God to a broken world. And again, if we had time, I could ask you, was there a time that you reached in to people in that way? Another way for people who have failed and need a second chance. When people sin, we should forgive them and we should comfort them so they won't give up in despair. And here's another one. When people are rude to you, be kind to them. How can you show mercy? Where's the place to show mercy when people are being rude to you? What do we tend to do when people are rude to us? Ark up, push them off, defend ourselves. Well, we can show mercy by actually being kind when people are rude because actually the rudeness that's coming your way is not about you, it's about the person and their inadequacy and their failing and their fractures. And often they want to posh themselves above you, push you down and their rudeness comes out. The Bible says don't repay evil for evil, never retaliate when people insult you or say unkind things about you. Instead, Pay them back with a blessing. This is what God wants for you to do and he will bless you for it. He will not forget the work that you have done and the love you've shown him by caring for and helping other people. Now, friends, as we close today, this is what God did for you. The Bible says, while we were still sinners... While we were hopeless and going our own way, not the scrap interested in God and his way, not initiating a relationship with God, God demonstrated his great love towards us in that while we were sinners, not while we were acceptable 
or on a demonstration of a worthy way. No, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He pushed past the offence, didn't say anything about it, knew we couldn't do anything about it, died on the cross and said, I forgive you. And all I'm asking you to do is to respond to me in repentance and receive the gift of salvation. That's what Jesus did. He didn't pay us back. He could have shunned us to hell forever, but he gave Jesus to show mercy and save us from our sins. How can we do anything less than to be agents of mercy in a broken world? Let us pray. Father God, we thank you today for this ministry of mercy that you have poured out upon us. We thank you, God, for the call upon our life to be agents of mercy. We thank you that Jesus is a supreme expression of your mercy to us. And God, we pray now as we celebrate and just share together words and music that mean deep things in light of what was spoken about today, would you help us respond? Lord, would you even allow us to wait a moment and to sing this in order that we might allow your spirit to touch our heart? And may out of this we respond in a way that is an agent of mercy in a broken world, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.